So excited for this one, everyone. Uh, as is the tradition on the Great Cricketer, um, you know, people are only defined by their numbers and not their personality. So let me read some numbers to kick things off. Uh, 167 tests, 604 wickets at 27, 25 for a best of eight for 15, I think. <laughs> 3,662 runs. Uh, we'll round that average up to 20. Uh, with a test century, 1350s and a high score of 167, 952 first class wickets all up. Uh, it's the pumping legs, the sweeping arm, oh. headband wearing, let's face it, England great Nash's legend, Stuart Broad, Broadie, welcome finally to the great cricketer. No, thanks for having me, guys. Can I call you Broadie, by the way? Of course you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, Brody, can or I? Nighthawk. Well, former Nighthawk now, aren't I? <laughs> 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 no, I'm good. Um, Brody, um, uh, can, I, can I begin mm. with some, uh, some common ground mm. uh, to just, just to kick this off? Um, when you smashed that ball to Michael Clark via Brad Haddon um, off the bowling of Ashton Agar, that was extremely funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and no cricketer with anything about them is walking no. in that situation. And anyone upset about it is only revealing their own idiocy. Um, are we happy to start on that note? <laughs> very happy. Very happy. The only, thing, the only word I'd change is the, the smashed. I think it was a fine nick and Brad actually dropped it off his glove, got caught first slip. And uh, <laughs> I, do, honestly, honestly, not one part of my brain said, I'm going to walk off it. Didn't even <laughs> didn't even consider it. I just looked at Alim Dar and he didn't give me out. I thought, mm, cool, let's keep going. <laughs> um, but I do remember. I think it was Darren Lehman might have been coach. We, uh, he came up on the big screen like leaning out the dressing room door, <laughs> like furious. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that was the first time I thought, oh, might have upset him a bit. Here. <laughs> um, I, I, Brody, let, 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 let's acknowledge that you've agreed to spend uh, some time with two Australians um, who may have um, seen some incidents you've been involved with differently to you. Um, uh, moreover, you'd probably be in the top 10 for a sea of blue messages from the grade cricketer unresponded to. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, why have you agreed to do this chat? <laughs> Uh, I got told I had to. <laughs> no, I <was> <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, yeah, I nearly came on. Uh, Dan Christian was messaging me, you know, who I played with yeah. at uh, Knotts and Hobart, a bit great friend of mine. He was like, "Come get on the on the grey cricketer." So I was I was really close to doing that, but I think it clashed with with training or something. Whereas now I don't have that responsibility <laughs> of having to train or play, and I've got more free time and. Quite handily, I've got a book out. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there we go. That does help. Yeah. Uh, Brody, you may have seen the other day that a an Indian journalist uh, asked Kusal Mendes in the uh, in the press conference before Sri Lanka Bangladesh if he wanted to congratulate Virat Kohli on his 49th um, ODI uh, ton. So in that mould, is there anything you want to say to Glenn Maxwell? Ah, uh, good question. I mean, I didn't get to watch all of the game. Uh, yesterday it was our sort of evening time but Neil Fairbrother who I don't know if you heard I yep. played in the 92 mm. World Cup yeah. in Melbourne text me I was driving from uh, Nottingham uh, from Manchester to Birmingham he texted me saying you have to get this cricket on so uh, I'm not I'm not actually physically driving past see get my phone out flick the cricket on the Aussies need 30 odd I think 30 odd off 30 balls or something and I, it took it, it took me a bit of time to work out what was going on because Glenn wasn't moving at all. You know, he was just like planting his feet and swinging and not running. And uh, I think Pat was eleven off sixty. And I don't know what had happened before, but the last thirty runs was just astonishing batting. He just the the talent you have to be able to have to not move your feet, not swing your body, and just like flick the ball for six. The strength and timing, like to be honest, I. I think every player in the world who's played with or against Glenn knows he's got that in him. You know, I used to hate bowling against him. You know, you just could never predict what was coming. You could bowl one ball and it would go over mid wicket. The next ball we'd reverse sweep you over cover. You know, it's just one of those like really uncomfortable players to bowl against. I think when you played against him, you'd always be saying, just try and bowl your best ball because he could just hit it up in the air. But if he has a day like he did yesterday, he just middled everything. And it was, I've heard, um, I think, 
punter's uh, commentary at the end was outstanding you know sort of um s- sort of building up how good at innings it is but there's no doubt that it's got to be one of the best ODI innings of all time 200 chasing when your team's 91 for 7 um the only way it could be eclipsed if if that happens in knockout cricket you know in a semi final or a final so yeah it was uh it was astonishing batting what do you, what do you, just staying on contemporary cricket before we get into the the book and your story um, what are you making of this World Cup so far? Uh, I mean, I think what Maxi did last night will go down in the annals of history. Um, but it, it does appear to me that there are a lot of teams at this World Cup who are very tired at the end of a, a really long year. Uh, and against the backdrop of, of where ODI is sitting as a format, etc. I mean, is it is it capturing your attention? Uh, and, and what are you making of England's performance as well? Um, I mean, England's performance has been a bit disastrous, to be honest. I, I don't, I don't think it's a, a time to rip up the strategy book and sack the coach, sack the captain. You know, I think Matthew Mott's the, the right guy for the job. I think Josh Butler's the right guy for the job. But I think we're definitely getting to that stage where we need some fresh faces to be able to to carry on that energy and the fear of failure style of cricket that the team has been so good at for for five five years, really five six years. So. You know, I think ultimately at the end of World Cups, guys are 32, 33, 34. There's a natural progression of of moving on and bringing young players in to target the next one. Um, so I think that will that will happen with the with the England team. Um, it's an interesting one with the with. I feel like it's been going on a long time. This World Cup, you know, if I look back to when England first played New Zealand, that feels a, a huge amount of time ago, and and it also makes it quite difficult for players to to come back in and perform in the team if you miss out. So someone like a Sammy Curran for us plays a couple of games, misses out. Now we've got a must-win game against the Netherlands. It's quite hard to bring him back in because he's not played cricket for three or four weeks. So uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a lover of knockout cricket. When I, when I was growing up and as a kid, you know, all the great, great sort of memories of games were the Aussies beating South Africa here at Edgebaston. What was that, 99 to go on to win the World Cup? That was a semi-final. I would personally prefer to see a quarterfinal. I prefer less sort of group games and then get into a quarterfinal and say, right, you've got to win three knockout games to win this World Cup. Um, just brings a little bit more more edge, a bit like the Rugby World Cup. You know, I, I wasn't that enthralled by the group stages, but I um, assume you guys weren't either. Um, but then the quarterfinal, <laughs> semifinal uh, and final, I loved. So I, I personally would would change the makeup and the style of it slightly so you got a bit more knockout cricket. But, um, you know, what do you think? Have you guys found it? Obviously, the time difference has been difficult for you, but... Uh, you know, it's fantastic, uh, the ODI World Cup. and um, I hope India wins. I hope India wins. Uh, <laughs> and uh, everyone's really happy and the, the views are up, you know? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I... It, it, it's it's a drag. It's going on for a long time. Um, but I suppose performances are accruing. I think India's stories are really like is is the big story of the World Cup, and it'll be interesting to see if they can uh, you know handle the the pressure of the semi in the final. To be honest, yeah. But also, uh, but also, you've got now we're getting to a bit of um, what's the right word? Uh, home advantage is playing quite a big part. If you look back, 2011, India won in India. 15, the Aussies won in in Australia. 19 England won in England and it, India just looks such a powerhouse, don't they? I mean, I just, they've got no chinks in the armour. I just I look at their bowling attack and you get through Bumrah and then, and Siraj and then Shami comes on and gets five. And then mm. if there's turn, Jadeja comes on and rags it. And mm. if you go and get 320, you might get Sharma out early and Kohli comes in and, you know, they've just got, they're just incredible. And I just, I just can't see them not winning this World Cup in India. And, mm. and ultimately that, that means they deserve to do it. Mm. Well, should we talk about? Uh, I think there was an Ashes this year. I think from memory, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and and I'm sure you've hardly had any quotes about that, uh, Brody, so far. But I just want to ask you uh, after the first Test match, <clears throat> obviously a great game there at Edge Baston. I recall you saying at the time that Zach Crawley's first ball that he hit for four crunch comments through uh, cover. You said at the time that that was your favourite ever Ashes memory. Uh, there's, I mean, there has been some good ones. Um, the boys were playing beer pong at Edgebasson afterwards, uh, after the game. I think it was either Baz or Ben maybe said that it felt like we won. Uh, Zach Crawley said in the in the following week, you know, I think we'll win the next game by 150. Um, but Jimmy Anderson said, if the wickets are like that, I won't be playing much longer. Um, do you think Do you think the series eventually won Jimmy over? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I felt for Jimmy because the, the wicket he'd have bowled the best on was Headingley and he didn't play. <laughs> you know, it, was one, it was the only pitch that sort of nipped around and swung. But yeah, those first two pitches were... Um, <clears throat> ultimately, I think you, you get a judge on a pitch quite early and obviously the Aussies bowled first, we batted first. And when, when bowlers like Pat Cummins and Hazelwood, the ball's bouncing twice to the keeper on day one, you're thinking, hmm... That's not great, you know. I'm not, I'm not overly looking forward to, to to bowling on that. And um, actually, I, so I had notes in the morning for a game. Talk about this quite a bit in the book, actually, to help my, my my like my mental focus and how I drive like my game forward. And my note on day two, um, when we came to bowl, was ignore the pitch. We you know, just acknowledge the fact now that the pitch isn't going to suit our bowling attack, but you know, get past that. Don't mention that to the other team. The, the, my teammates don't need to hear that. Just run in with all your heart, engage the crowd and drive the game forward. So I, the why, why I write notes is because if I hadn't have written that down in the morning and got it out of my head, if if I'm bowling on the pitch and it's bouncing twice to the keeper, I'm going, pitch is rubbish. Pitch is crap. What, what, what are we doing here? Why, why are we not playing on inside the pitch? Whereas at least when I've written it down and got it out of my head and said, don't mention it, I'm stubborn enough not to mention it. So, um, yeah, it was, I, I felt for Jimmy because things didn't go quite go his way. A couple of drop catches early, which you always, you just want to get into the series. And, um, and the, you know, when we get to Lords, both teams just bowl bouncers. You know, Cam Green started it off by, you know, Nathan Lyon did his calf. Same in, I did a couple of years ago at, at, at Lords actually. And then Cam Green showed all the bowlers how to do it by just bowling cross seam bouncers. And he was hitting Rooty and Popey pulled one and and we looked at that and said that's the way to go and and uh that's we ended up on the most amount of bounces ever in a in innings i think in that mm-hmm. second inning so um yeah it, it was a i thought it was amazing actually i don't know what you guys thought, I thought oh, it, had, yeah. it had absolutely everything it, it got ignited a bit with the best of stumping which completely split opinions um i loved that sort of thing you know i, I wasn't <laughs> saying i loved the stumping but i love I, I just loved that how it galvanized both countries into battle, if that makes sense. And it, you know, it's uh, every, I was thinking cricket, if the prime ministers get involved, you think, okay, something's happened. There. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was, I just thought that sort of galvanized the series and, and the style of cricket after was awesome. Um, it's a great leaping off point because in, we'd love to talk about the ashes uh, as well. Your book talks a lot about the ashes. Uh, you are, you've developed an identity around being an Ashes legend, really. Uh, and one thing I note from your book, Broadly, um, which is called Broadly Speaking, by the way, um, and I just want to say it's available in all good bookshops, Australia, uh, India and England, because that just sounds like something you've got to say. I think people know where to get books, but anyway. Bookshops. Um, yeah, bookshops. Mm. Uh, is that um, you uh, all have this um, tendency through the book to um, – turn anything negative that might have happened in your life or whatever to a positive. You, you speak with a lot of uh, positivity about your own career. And uh, I know that you're not allowed to use the word basball and that McCullum hates it uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, the Collins Dictionary got the definition wrong, I think. Like uh, it's not just about batting. It's, a, it's like a style of cricket that emphasises playing with um, fun and uh, freedom and the absence of fear. And I completely, I completely agree with you. Yeah, like I, I just wondered whether um, that style of play just agreed with you and your personality beautifully, having read the book and seen how much positivity is a part of how you play, as you explained there. Is, was was baseball just the great crescendo to your career and the style of play that you like to play in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, when I look back at my uh, growing up years, so I loved loads of different sports, whether that's, you know, rugby, football, cricket, hockey. Whenever I got in the car after playing uh, as a kid, my mum would be, have you had fun? Have you enjoyed it? It was never, why did you drop that catch? Or why didn't you score those runs? Or you shouldn't have missed that straight ball. Or you missed that, you missed that goal. You should have kept your head down or something. It was always based around fun and enjoyment and never the result. And ultimately that came full circle when Baz took over because Baz took over start of 2022 and that was exactly his message to the group we're going to take the result out of the equation our number one goal is entertainment ultimately people are, have got the choice of buying tickets to the theatre the zoo the cinema or coming to watch us at Lords entertain them you know hit, hit sixes hit fours if, if you know his favourite saying is run towards the danger if you think 
you want to take it on, take it on. And I've never in 15, 16 months as a head coach heard him say a, a negative word ever. I've never, and ultimately I think he would, he would almost burst his own style if, if a batter got out caught long on and he came in and went, oh, not, not a great option that, not a great shot. He always will go, you just need one more yard. You just one more yard next time and, and we've got six. And and he's been so authentic in in how he's gone about that business. It, I'd almost say he's sort of got rid of the fear of failure because obviously you can entertain if you score 10 runs. And I sort of for me, it opened up just looking to take wickets. I wasn't scared about getting hit for four or, or um, my economy rate being high because Stokes, he just genuinely didn't care. He, Stokes, he would come to you at the end of Mark, start the spell and just go, how are we getting wickets? So it was never, oh God, like Steve Smith's flying to shut him down. It's like, how are we getting wickets? Uh, and maybe there's times where the game got away from us a little bit in the ashes. Someone like a Mitch Marsh came in at Headingley, like whacked it. Do you remember? He just belted it everywhere. Yes. And all we were doing is, how do we get him out? How do we get him out? And he scored an incredible, I think he got 100, didn't he? He scored an incredible 100. And... um you know, we were just thinking out, out, out the whole time and it, it, we couldn't control him. But then well, he meant, eventually got him. But I think the, you know, the freedom of of taking the pressure away from the players and the results and just saying, go and have fun. You know, if you want to hit it for four, hit it for four. If you want to try uh, a Yorker, a bouncer, don't care about going to the boundary, just just go for it. And and ultimately, it was the most enjoyable 15 months of of my career. And, I, you know, I think, I think the fact, actually, moment i was walking with my um partner molly where we live and we're you know down so we lost at edge bastard and lost at lords and a f some fans came over and sort of walked past and went loving the cricket keep going like it's, it's awesome we're loving every minute and i almost wanted to go hang on a minute we're two nil down you know i, I need to i almost had to tell them we're, we're losing a series here but um that was that was almost my mindset going, wow, like our public have bought into Baz's philosophy that the result doesn't matter. You can entertain whatever. And, um, you know, there's a few players that have really thrived off that. And I was, I was definitely one of them. Um, you may have come across the clip online, Brody, of uh, the Australian players talking to a couple of guys from the internet um, about uh, what happened at Johnny, uh, with Johnny at, uh, at Lords at lunchtime. Um, are, we, are we ready to say from an English perspective that that was the funniest thing Dave Warner's ever said? In a, in a short list? Um, I've got to admit, I'm a bit devastated because I was batting at the time. Mm. I wasn't in the lunchroom. But uh, I think a few of the, what I've heard is, you know, Johnny didn't go up for lunch all week, but he did go up, <laughs> go up that week. Um, I don't know whether it's because he'd been run out in controversial fashion or whether actually sticky toffee pudding was on the menu. It might have been that. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um <laughs> But it, uh, it was, you know, that Lord's lunchroom is quite a unique setup in the fact that you, you're you eating on um, you know, rectangular tables five yards away from each other, both teams, and there's a big screen with Sky showing the cricket. So the, all, the, all they're doing is repeating like, what's happened. And, you know, bear in mind, that's your only like 40 minute break to chill out and get your mind away from cricket. All you do is you've got guys just eating the meal and 22 players just staring at the tv <laughs> and watching what's going on so i can see how that um that did occur i think zach crawley actually was sat opposite zach uh, uh, uh opposite johnny and zach it's quite cheeky he was like johnny johnny do you reckon they're happy with that do you reckon they're happy with that go and ask him and he said within 0.5 seconds johnny's up you happy with that lad? <laughs> um, so uh yeah it was uh i actually walked past johnny to go out to bat in the Lord's long room. And normally you'd have that, oh, is it, what's it doing, John? Is it swinging? Or, you know, any in batter you're crossing, is it swinging? Is it seeming? What do you think about driving? You know, is it glary out there? So it gets, he just staring at the floor, like breathing the heaviest I've ever heard anyone breathe. I thought, hmm, he's fired up there. But that made me fired up. I, I honestly, like, I didn't really see what had happened. Honestly, I, mm. I was, because you're next to him, Lord, you can't really see what's going on. So, my sort of red mist that came about in that 10 minutes, which mm. I'm, I was hugely embarrassed about that evening, that came from just the crowd's energy because I hadn't really, really connected with what's gone on. And I hadn't had time, of course, to study timings and umpires saying over and cap to the bowler, all that sort of stuff. So my, you know, red mist of 
attacking anyone with a green cap on came from the crowd and uh well, i quite enjoyed it for that 10 minutes and then then i managed to control my emotions a bit yeah i heard you tell that story a few times like uh what it didn't make sense to me was that uh you you say that you're embarrassed that night but it <laughs> seems like you've quite enjoyed it in, in the post so like when you look back on the behavior are you embarrassed or I or are you happy with it? Because I've heard you also talk about it and say, well, you actually believe that the way you acted in that game where you lost actually galvanised the team and was quite a psychological masterstroke. So what is it? Mm. Can it be both? <laughs> well, it doesn't <laughs> seem to make sense. It doesn't the, make any sense. The, 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 bit, the longevity mm. and the petulance of saying in every time I got in my mm. crease for two hours was probably the bit I look back and go, oh, gosh, what was I doing? Uh, um, and also, I really like Pat as a, a guy. So my sort of shouting at him and, you know, calling him names, uh, I'm a bit like, I like him too much to have done that. But also, it was the it was the action that upset me in that moment. So, um, you know, I'm sure that I'm sure that we'll be able to share a nice glass of red in the future when we're when we're both both done and dusted and and smile about it. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I uh, I had a nibble on someone uh, someone on Instagram comments the other day because I think actually after that session, although we lost that game, we you know Australia deserves to be two 0 up. The, the the innings of the guys at, at Edgebaston phenomenal. As soon as Edgebaston, as soon as Rooty caught Carey, I thought game over. And then Pat and and. Um, and Nathan Lyon came out and played great. Lords, we got dominated. Really. It deserved to lose that game. Um, so, but I think from then we we ignited into business. And you know, I think we did outplay Australia in those final three Test matches. And there's loads of reasons for that. Ultimately, Nathan Lyon missed missed the rest of the series. It, he'd been crucial for for the Aussies in the last hundred and whatever Test matches. And there's a sort of slight changing momentum but um yeah I, it, I think yeah we just unsettled the Aussies for a little period of time there uh, yeah I just want to pick up on that as well Brody because I'm listening to um you describe the freedom that the again for one of a better term that Brendan McCullum's coaching style and philosophy brings to the team clearly there's like all of the positivity outweighs any kind of pragmatism there and it agrees with you uh I felt like the Ashes has now been um, understood to be this thing where England like heroically reversed the momentum to um, save the series. But when we were there for the first two tests, I thought you guys outplayed Australia in the first game. Uh, I thought Australia's tactics were a concession that you guys were playing better cricket than them. I thought Australia jammied two wins uh, and hung on for dear life with some weather. I just wonder whether there's another view that you guys should have just won the series. I mean, we definitely, we definitely feel like we should have won the series, mm -hmm. but ultimately that's test cricket and should have, would have, could have really. I mean, we, yeah, we felt like we didn't quite hit our straps at, at edge Baston, but we, um, we should have won that test match. You know, and I took full responsibility for that at the end of the game, because there was a big decision. And as an opening bowler, you always have that call that, so Mo and Ali had the cut finger, couldn't really bowl. Jimmy had a bit of a groin problem, couldn't bowl. So it was me and Robbo. Stokes knee had gone. So it was me and Robbo and and we'd been bowling bouncers at Pat and um Nathan Lyon. And we'd created a chance. Remember Stokes he nearly took a, a belt yeah. of a catch. They weren't really going anywhere because they had to nail a six to clear the because we had men on the boundary. And then we got together when it was new ball time. I think the Aussies needed like thirty or twenty five. It's like I said, let's take the new ball. You know, if it just sips on, get a nick. Let's clear this game out. Let, let's get it done. And ultimately, I think looking through that whole test match, the new ball was the best time to bat. Mm. And the ball just came on. You know, both guys played some really good shots and got got over the line. And I, I was quite emotional at the end of that game because I felt it was my responsibility as a senior player. I should have been able to recognise actually old ball. They're not going anywhere. They'll make a mistake. Uh, and I went down the route of new ball, um, and you know they they got over the line. But yeah, there were there were a few reasons why we didn't win that game. Yeah, some great batting from the Aussies on that final day, but also we we should have put the nail in the the coffin the day before. Um, you know we we had a few 
unlike us dismissals in the middle order that just let the Aussies back in. Uh, and ultimately, they shouldn't have been chasing 250, 260, whatever. They sh- we should have put the game to bed and got 350, 400. So, yeah, there was that, that, that edge busting game. Although we, we played pretty good, we, we knew we'd let that game go a little bit. And um, I actually disagree with Lords. I think we got outplayed completely. I think that, that morning, day one, win the toss bowl, uh, Warner played great. Uzi, we just we struggled to get Uzi out all series. Just gr- he just grinded that new ball down, um, and uh, you know that was an opportunity for us to bowl the Aussies out quite cheaply, and we didn't manage it. And then also when when um, did uh, Nathan Lyon go, out, go down first innings? We had a chance to build a pretty decent score, and Cam Green actually made a difference, bouncing us out. So there were there were moments that we didn't qu- get quite right, but then I think from from Leeds, Manchester, the Oval. We put to, we put together some pretty good cricket, you know, it, and ultimately the weather at Manchester was expected. To be honest, you know, you know that's what happens there a little bit. Um, but you know, a bit of a shame from our point of view. But but ultimately, the end the end stays with with the Aussies, and we we can't argue that fact. Um, I know you're upset, Brody, that uh, Ollie Robinson took your mantle as most hated man in Australia for a small period of time. I know you're upset by that. Um, so, I mean, do you prefer being the most hated man in Australia sort of every four years? Or um, I'm guessing you're reminded every day that Yuvraj Singh once hit six sixes against you. Which one do you sort of prefer in that category? Yeah, not a great choice, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yeah, I, I was a bit. Yeah, I was a bit disappointed with Robbo because I, I love, I do love that sort of um, battle I have with with the Aussie fans, and I, you know, I, I love the. I've got to always have a bit of a wry smile, you know, when I get talked about the rivalry between England and Australia, because ultimately, uh, and I found when writing this book, all my all my big talking points and big moments that I reflected on were England versus Australia. It was like Ashley's cricket was sort of embedded in my life. And mm-hmm. and it, when I look back, you know, I was six months old when my dad went in 86, 87. And, you know, it just felt like England, Australia has almost like built my career and my life. And I've all, I'm always going to have a great connection to that. But yeah, when Robbo had a pop at Ponting, wasn't it? Out of nowhere. And that uh, and the Ponting was like, <laughs> hang on a minute, where have I, is, yeah, where have I got dragged yeah, yeah. You know, Ponting was back involved. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that that made that that made me smile. But um, yeah, I I can't. What was the? Oh, it was um, Robbo politely told Uzi to go from the field after Uzi had got like 180 or something, didn't <laughs> yeah. it? And that ignited the um, yeah. that ignited the the disappointment in the Aussies. It sort of it, yeah it revved it up. But I, yeah, I think I managed to drag back a little bit of the the um, public en- enemy yeah. number one towards the end of the series. Did I? Or yeah, no, you came you came back well. Um, <laughs> I actually, I mean, Brody, you, you've but you've been such an important part of the narrative around the Ashes, and and you've embraced it. And as an Australian, uh, th- there always seemed to be this like circular argument. I want to ask you about this like circular argument that like w- we could never defeat. Uh, if if we ever felt something that you said was ridiculous, then therefore we'd been rattled by that. Yeah. Uh, so you know, and and so if you're rattled by it, then Brody's won. But if you don't respond, then Brody's owning the the the, the build up war, and thus you're a weak Australian. Yeah. Like so, do, do you regard yourself as the? And, and then it's like, well, Brody knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, he's, 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 he's good, good Brody. He's, he's good, good Brody. He? He's, he's, good, he's got he? the old bay out there. <laughs> do, do you yeah, regard the, um, yourself the chat master of, of world cricket? Like, is there any Aussie whose chat you've ever respected? The the bit that um, brought a little bit of a smile to my face this summer was, um, I'd been. I'd been studying Marnus and Steve uh, and their techniques of because I've really struggled against them. Always had, you know. I, 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 I'm a well-seen bowler that tries to nip the ball back to the stumps, and both of them play that really well. So I, I was looking at different dismissals, and I knew I had to bring in the fine nick. Had to try and get the the fine edge to to get them out, or they were going to dominate me again. And uh, I did a. You know, a really chilled interview after playing for Knots one day. It was the like end of the day interview. And I said, uh, I'm working on an outswinger to Marnus and, and it's designed at Marnus and, and Steve. And, you know, I'm 30, 36 years old at the time and I've got 500 odd test wickets. I can bowl an outswinger. But, you know, <laughs> it was like, it was me just like planting a little bit of, um, I don't know, a bit of news into building up to the ashes. And then and then just to try and add a little bit of 
I don't know, a little bit of uh, mindset pressure to 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 those two because they've been so dominant against me. And then to get Marnus first ball with it at Edgebaston when he nicked it to mm-hmm. to Johnny took a great catch. That's why I ran around like a you know headless chicken just charging around the field because I was like, there's just something in that that had worked and it never seems to work for me against any other team apart from Australia when I just have the you know I bear in mind I grew up with Glenn McGrath saying five nil every time mm. you know it's almost like he'd land he'd land at Heathrow in his Aussie jacket and tie first camera in front of him we're going to win five nil and I'm going to get after <laughs> and every time and you're like it's going to happen isn't it it's going to happen so it's sort of you know he was my hero I had a poster of McGrath on my wall when I was a kid so it was almost like I I picked up little tips from him when I was a kid growing up, and I thought if I ever ever get the ever get the chance to fire a few back, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. Can I ask, uh, probably you just, just I got one more question just about the the ashes that's just been, and then a couple of um broader ones, but pardon the pun. But um, you just mentioned before uh, this idea, and I think it's an important one to talk about. Um, the idea of pe- perhaps having a glass of red with um, you know, with Pat and uh and and putting the guns down and and all those kinds of things um uh, in the in the book and, and you've talked about this before um during what was happening at lords there's this um thing that keeps getting repeated to, to alex carey that you know this this is all you'll be remembered for this is all you'll be remembered for um like you know he's, he's it looks to me like he's probably suffered a fair bit from that um like is there a point post career for you where you you hope that he's not remembered for that yeah i mean i, I think the way to remember that comment is I also said that that's the worst thing I've seen in cricket in 17 years, which is a complete load of nonsense. Of course, it's not the worst thing I've seen in cricket in 17 years. Do you know what I mean? It was it, it was a stumping that uh, that was celebrated and Johnny got given out. So, um, I yeah, I saw Red Mist for 10 minutes and it was all built up from the crowd, like I mentioned earlier. And I was just seeing green caps and saying whatever came first to me and uh actually when you look back uh, i've i've seen that footage recently and i say oh that's all you're gonna be remembered for and he actually agreed he goes yep yep so uh, it's you know maybe you know it, uh, do i regret saying it no because i was just in the heat of the bat and it's ashes cricket and uh, ultimately i don't think any player really takes anything that another player says in the field that seriously but i think definitely the media pressure around that that um incident would affect any player mm. any player at the international level that's re- very difficult and i think that's the difficulty about playing away from home to be honest because if that incident happened in australia it had been talked about for a couple of days and probably moved on from because the aussie press wouldn't have carried it on whereas mm. the english it was a big talking point in england the english public dived into it even to the fact there was some nonsense about a haircut wasn't there at some stage you know that all that sort of all that sort of, um, you know, all the outward news builds pressure on a player would only come when you're away from home. So um, I, th- I don't think it was the comment that that put Alex under any sort of pressure. But the the outward media makes it very difficult being being uh, being an, a, a player away from home. And I had that in thirteen when Lehman said, you know go home, send him home crying or something. Do you remember? It was like a, yeah, you know, grim. Uh, yeah, and yeah, grim. everyone just, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, there was all those t-shirts, yellow t-shirts, yeah. with Stuart Broad's a shit bloke on, all that sort yeah. of stuff. I actually got one of them for Christmas that year, which was quite fun. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, but uh, yeah, it, I think, I think if that incident happened in Australia, we wouldn't have really battled. It wouldn't have been a talking point for more than two or three days. But I think it was just one of those things that the English press and the England public thought, we can ignite this and get the series going. All I know is that Angela Matthews should have been at the crease sooner. He should have checked his helmet <laughs> and Shakib Al Hassan was right to do what he did. What was going on there? <laughs> <laughs> With the drama that happens, you know, I'm surprised that's not happened in Ashes cricket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just what Ashes cr- but come on. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm allowed to say what I think now because I can't get fined, but um, <laughs> The, really, really, like I feel like if you look back at umpires gone, you know, like a Dickie Bird or someone, they just go, just get on with the game. Yeah, you know, mm. I'm not accepting. I'm not accepting that appeal. His helmet's broken. I wouldn't make him bat with a broken bat. Yeah, you know, change your helmet and come and face the ball. And if you're over eight down, I'll give you two minutes at the end. Let's play. 
you know what I mean? Yes, I, I do. Think yeah. We we almost need to get back to that a little bit rather than actually fifteen point four on page four hundred thirty six says that he he might have missed the two minutes, so he's out. Yeah. And it's you know, but I think someone told me I don't actually know that, but someone told me he was actually ready to face within the two minutes. He was, but then he was, yeah. Pulled the helmet strap and it broke, so yeah. he actually should have been out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he know. just walked, and then he walked off, and I think Shucky got the shits, and uh, yeah. and and then just decided to, um, you know, play the card. So mm. the only the only thing that would have made that slightly better, you know, when Angelo got him out, he pointed to his watch, mm. like he was like, mm. when he, well, really, that's a finable offence because you're not allowed to send a batter off. <laughs> so imagine if the ICC had actually find him. <laughs> You'd find him for, for that. you have been ti- first bloke ever to be to be timed out and you lose your match fee because you sent the, the battle. Out. Yeah, yeah. When when that guy was player of the match. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, just yeah. uh, just on that broad, yeah. you, you know, that it's great to hear your reflections on how things, mm. you know, should actually be. But um like I actually had a uh, personal sadness at your retirement, probably owing to the familiarity of, you know, you and test cricket um like you, you know you would contribute narratives to the, a world that i grew up with and understood and had a classic uh, element to it and a, and a tradition um you know that the ashes that's just been may well be the last series where uh before you know a, an indian cement company owner decides who's allowed to play or not you know like and and uh, more and more i'm reading about t20 lingo and you know lsg hitting 257 off 20 uh like is there a part of you glad to be getting out of cricket um when you have no not at all i mean i'll um i think part of me moving away from the game was was very much that I was I, I've loved every moment of of the recent times last fifteen months. Baz Stokesy have have filled you know my mind with joy of of how to play cricket and I I was bowling really well. I was I, I felt fit, felt fresh. So I hadn't let my body get to stage where that started to let me down, and I hadn't let my mind get to stage where I, w- I would lose form and start to really struggle. So. I, I knew I wanted to leave at the, at the very top, um, playing for England. England versus Australia has been the pinnacle for me for for my whole life. And, um, you know, ultimately, when you get to 36, what I didn't want to do is walk off, tear a hamstring somewhere and walk off and that be the end of me. Because a lot of the people I've spoken to, when the ones that have moved away from the game well, are the ones that was their choice. And it wasn't a selector calling them going, you're done. You know, it wasn't someone else telling them that they were done. And why it was so difficult to make the call is because I genuinely felt I had another couple of years left in me. Mm-hmm. You know, my great mate, Jimmy's 41 and he, he inspires me. And I could, I, I not said I could get to 41, but I could have played more. I was feeling good, but I, I knew I wanted to leave the game with in- incredible feelings and memories. So when I speak to my daughter or when I speak to the g- next generation coming through, it'll be, it'll be how amazing cricket is rather than let myself fall off a cliff and go, Oh, you know, it's all right. It's a good game, but you know, maybe try golf type thing. So, you know, I was, um, you know, I, I felt great. Uh, I actually feel really positive about the state of Test match cricket, and I know that I might be slightly biased because it's it's strong in England and Australia, and but I think what Baz has taught us is cricket can be played in a slightly different way. And I think in years to come, we'll we'll see. Obviously, the T Twenty franchise world's going nowhere. The IPL is so strong. I think it's second tv rights behind the nfl so it's you know it's an incredible spectacle that's going on there but i think test sides will start picking players out of of the t20 format and go just come and do this for a bit longer come and play come and play that same style but just do it for a bit bit longer and players will have the talent to do that i mean sort of what the aussies did with warner 15 years ago wasn't it he hadn't played a huge amount of of um you know, list A stuff before he, he played for the Aussies. And I think I think that we could get to a stage where a lot of different countries take up the baseball style and pick players out of T20 cricket and say, I don't care if you get caught long off. I, I don't care if you nick off first ball of a test match. Come and do it and entertain the crowds. And to me, if test cricket ended up like that in five, ten years, I'd go and watch it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stuart Broad, thanks so much for your time, man. I know for us... Uh, it- speaking to you, something we've wanted to do for a really long time. Um, 
congratulations on the release of your book. Broadly speaking, you can get it anywhere. Uh, and uh, there's some um, pretty cool reflections in depth on the ashes uh, that, that uh, you know, has captivated so many of us for so long. Um, and all the best with whatever comes next for you. Uh, and just because I've got you um, now, th- there will be further messages from us to do stuff together. And just please continue to ignore them uh, and <laughs> just consolidate that dynamic. <laughs> I actually, I feel like I've missed a trick in Australia with this book. I should have put some dartboard numbers around the edge of the book. (laughs) You could could either... you can either read it or just use it as a dartboard. Well, Brody, you've left now, you know, so <laughs> we can probably say that uh, we quite admired you because you reminded us of us because you were competitive. Uh, so, um, but I say that begrudgingly, uh, as is my want. Um, Brody, th- thanks so much for joining us. No, cheers, guys. <laughs>